And uh, first thing I'd like to do is acknowledge uh, Chris and Ryan from the Loyalty Group because uh, they've been out there telling people to come to this uh, webinar today. Some of you on the call may have not been on a webinar before, so it might be new to you to actually stare at a screen on a computer and hear someone talking in the background. Um, look, the objective of today, from my perspective, is to make sure that we can give you as much valuable information as we can about uh, price competition and how to eliminate it. Um, I will be taking questions if we have time. Um, on the right hand side of your screen you should have a control panel and there is a question box in that control panel so um, if you have any questions along the way feel, please feel free to add them there and I'll try and respond to those as I can um, but other than that uh, let's get into the conversation so price competition um, I know I've known Chris uh, and the loyalty group for quite a long time now and uh, I know that this topic comes up a lot and Chris called me and said, David, do you think you could actually help us with, with um, how people deal with this? So, so let's just go through a bit of, uh, a bit of my background first. Um, my name's David Guest. Uh, I run a business coaching company that I've been running for the past 15 years. Uh, prior to that, I was in sales and marketing for probably about eight years. And during that time, you know, I've, I've been a very diligent learner. I, I read lots and lots of books. I go to lots and lots of workshops. And what I've learned is by educating myself on marketing and on sales uh, and on psychology and on how to communicate. I've been able to improve my ability to sell. I've been able to improve my business and now I spend most of my time teaching other people how to do the same. Um, I've, been, I've been involved with the Action Group which is a coaching organization that's global. Um, in 2012 uh, we won the Global Marketing uh, Coach Award uh, for the systems that we're going to be talking about today. I've also won awards in helping people um, getting good results in a profitability point of view um, and also some program development. So look, enough about me, let's talk about the real issue. Um, this price competition thing. Now I know people out there in the retail space are hurting because of globalization. I know people who are in industry are getting hurt by the, the changes in the economy. Um, but what I want to suggest to you is that price competition is something that we can deal with. It's something that we can actually eliminate uh, if we have a strategy in place. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to teach you my best knowledge on this area. I'm going to show you some of the easy ways to remove price competition and uh, then you can sort of take some of that information away and use it as you will um, or you can do some research yourself and see what else you can do to add to that. But look, before we even start on price competition, I just want to talk a little bit about psychology because one of the things I've noticed with the people that I work with in business is that you know, there's, there's two kinds of people that run businesses and I often ask this question, are you above or below the line? So if we look at the one kind of person, that's the person that basically says it's not my fault. It's, uh, it's either my customer, it's my supplier, it's my competitor, it's everybody else's fault except for me. And this is called the blame game. Uh, the second thing these people do is they have lots and lots of excuses. So, you know, they blame the economy, they blame the imports from overseas, they blame everything else except for themselves. Or the last, the last sort of behavior below that line is denial. And, and these are those people who think they're doing all right because they're busy, or they might sort of, uh, you know, they just justify or they just sort of explain things away and not really look at what's going on. So if you think about the word denial, it basically means you're lying to the one person on the planet you should never lie to, yourself. So we call this below the line behavior. And the reason we do call it that is because it's all about, um, pointing the finger at someone else or actually not looking at the problem square in the face. Now, there's a bit of a danger with that one. And the danger with that is that as long as I do that, I can't fix anything because I can't fix the economy. I can't fix my competitor. I can't fix my customer and I can't fix price competition if I don't accept that it's something to do with what I'm doing. So the other side of the line, we have this thing called ownership. And that's really what happens when you do run your own business or you actually run a, you're in a sales job, you own your own ship. And as long as you own your own ship, you're in control. So the first thing we need to do is we need to take ownership. The second thing we need to do is be accountable. And if you look at the word accountable, there's a little word in the middle called count. Now, the reason I bring that up is because we need to be accountable for our results. If you are seeing price competition in the market, great. At least you're seeing it and you can do something about it. That's what being responsible is all about. Because when we talk about responsibility, we're talking about how you respond to this price competition. So just to sort of give you a bit of a demonstration, when we talk about this sort of uh, behavior, uh, below the line people generally look a bit like this and the above the line people look like this. But ultimately, when we're down below this line, people have lots and lots of reasons 
why they're unsuccessful. And uh, reasons is just a nice word for excuses. And if we go above the line, we're looking for results. So what I'm looking for with the people that I'm working with or the people that I'm teaching about price competition is how do we get better results? So let's talk about price competition. Let's get straight to the chase here. Um, what creates price competition? So it's a very good question. It's very tricky to answer because ultimately if we look at price competition, it's created by a couple of things. The first thing that creates price competition is having a fully informed buyer. Now what I mean by this is someone who basically has more knowledge about the product than I do. They can do their research and it's happening more and more as we go online because people do a lot of their shopping online. They do a lot of their research online and they find out a lot about their products or services through online. The issue with this, right, is we do have fully informed buyers and that definitely creates price competition. So the second thing that creates it is having this alternative choice of supply. And what we know these days is that people are doing shopping on their mobile phone while they're in our store. They're actually, while they're talking to us on the phone, they're searching Google. Uh, it's so easy to get alternative choice of supply that it's really starting to drive our prices down. So if we know that these two things are creating price competition, at least we know where to start. Now, what we need to do is think about how do we deal with these situations. So first rule, and often I get shot for this one, is that I'm not a big believer that people buy on price. In, as a matter of fact, I don't believe people ever buy on price. Uh, even though they say they do, even though they ask you, is that the cheapest you can do? I had an email from a client today who's, who basically sells cleaning. And um, they said, how do I deal with this? This is an email from a customer that says, I've just got this price from your competitor. Can you beat it? Now, I know that other people are faced with this. Um, the problem is that when we read that email, the first thing it tells us to do is we have to drop our price. But if we try and interpret what the person's looking for there when they say, can you beat it? They're not actually looking for a better price. What they're looking for is value. Now, let's just think about that for a moment. People don't buy on price, they buy on value. And when someone says to me, can you beat this price that I got from a competitor? There's an underlying assumption. And the underlying assumption is the products are exactly the same. Now, if the products are exactly the same, then surely price is the primary reason that I would buy it from you and not from someone else. But often people misunderstand what product, like is there such thing as an identical product? Because it's, there's, there's more to a product than just the physical shape of it. It's also how it's delivered to you, when it's delivered to you, you know, what sort of guarantee or what sort of feeling I have around the company that I buy it from. And these are all things that contribute to value. <clears throat> so the first thing I want you to think about when we look at price competition is take it out of your head that people just want a cheaper price. Because as soon as we admit that people just want a cheaper price, we've got nowhere to go except for price. If we recognize that it for what it really is, which is people questioning the value or the difference between your product and the competitive product, we've got something to work on here. So let's assume people buy on value, not on price. An interesting sign I saw, I thought that everyone would be sort of uh, get a lot of value out of seeing this one as well. Have a look at this sign. Basically what it says is it says when we offer service, there's three kinds, good, cheap and fast, but you can only pick two. So good service, um, cheap won't be fast. Good service, fast won't be cheap. Fast service, cheap won't be good. So if you can only pick two and you have a choice in the type of customer that you want, which one do you want? Because you can be cheap, right? Because people will buy cheap products, but what they'll sacrifice is quality or speed. Because I can jump online on eBay today and I can buy shoes for 100 bucks that are normally 200 bucks in the shop and I can buy them from China and they're gonna take a week and a half to get here, uh, so it's not fast. Um, are they good? I'm not sure. They tell me they're good, but uh, they could be copies. So we've got to look at this triangle of three kinds of service, good, cheap, and fast. And we've got to look at how can we integrate this into how we deliver value to our clients. Because my preference is not to be cheap. My preference is to be good and fast, and that way we can be more expensive than our competitors. So let's keep looking at value. And I just want to go into a little bit about, you know, where does value come from? So if we look at what value is, and we look at those three things, good, cheap, fast, we can use a formula and say, look, the value of a product is a combination of the quality of the product, the speed that we deliver the product in, 
and finally the price or it's inversely proportional so the cheaper the product the higher the perceived value so we've got three things we can work with here not just one and the two that I love working on is quality and speed because we can adjust these by providing customer service by providing value added things like um, wrapping things nicely speed means if we have a local retail store we can actually sell directly so we've got these sort of options where we can actually improve the value performance proposition and the key here is to say well okay let's not use price as the only mechanism for determining value let's start looking at the other two and seeing how we can actually adjust those so that we can improve the value of our product so I want to talk a little bit about niche now Niche is a French word, but uh, if we think about what it means in terms of marketing and sales, it means getting into a space or getting into an area where it's small and it's, it's sort of highlighted that you're a specialist in that particular area. So if we look at niche in terms of business, most people don't understand exactly what it is or how to get one. My suggestion is that you need to look at niche as, by definition, being in a place where no one else can compete. Now. It sounds ludicrous to go into no price competition, but this is what niche is all about. The, 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 the more defined your niche is, and the more specific you are in what you sell into that niche, the less price comes into the equation. You know, I can look at some big brands around this and we can talk about Apple computers. You know, Apple computers still just sell a computer, but there's no competition to Apple because it's a brand. And when people buy an Apple computer, it's a closed system. Look, some people, they love them because they just work. Other people hate them because they're not um, compatible with so many different things. But in the end of the day, they are making a premium product and they're charging a premium price in what's considered a competitive market. Just think about how much of this technology is coming out of the you know, mass production lines and how much of it is getting really, really beat up on price compared to what Apple are doing. So we need to think about niche by definition as being something that has uh, an area that has no price competition. So let's move into this a little bit deeper and talk about what this whole notion of no price competition means. Niche by definition means that I'm unique, right? It means no one else has got the same product or service as I do. Now in a world as big as ours where people can jump online and they can buy products from anywhere at any time, at any price, this is even more important now than it used to be because one of our unique selling propositions used to be that we had the product here. And so people wouldn't go online, they wouldn't trust the online um, stores, they wouldn't know where it was coming from, they wouldn't know if it was a scam. So part of our uniqueness was locality. This is becoming less and less a predominant decision maker for most people. So they're looking for other reasons to justify why they buy from you and not your competitors. If you don't invest the time building this uniqueness around your product, and I will tell you that if the only thing you can say is unique about your product is that you provide better service, that's very fluffy. People are looking for something much more specific than just you provide better service. You can use price. Price is something that's a problem because if you use price to attract clients, the problem is they're not loyal to you, they're loyal to your price, which means that as soon as your competitor is cheaper, they're just gonna switch. So you need to really focus in on this thing called unique selling proposition. The second thing I'd like to discuss in this area is having a guarantee in place. See, one of the things that you can do to actually create a unique selling proposition is guarantee your product or service. Now, I'm not talking about just a verbal guarantee. I'm talking about a written guarantee. I'll just give you a very quick story on this one. You know, we were doing some work with a, a wedding photographer and the first thing I always ask when we talk about guarantees is what is the thing that your prospective client fears the most? And if we think about what people fear the most, that's what we want to guarantee. So if we think about wedding photography, the thing that the customer fears the most is the bride's fear that the wedding photos don't turn out. Now, if the wedding photos don't turn out, what does she do? She panics. She's not happy. She's going to be very upset about the whole situation. So we put a guarantee in place. And the guarantee basically stated that if you're not happy with the wedding photographs, it's not that you don't have to pay. We actually went beyond that and said, we will pay to reshoot the whole wedding scene. That includes paying for any international visit visitors that need to be flown back into the country, the rental of the church or the rental of the hall, the rental of the limo, the rental of all the formal wear. Now, that's a ludicrous sounding guarantee, but let's think about the reality of what that costs. This guy who'd been in the wedding photography game for many, many years, he said, look, the average wedding has maybe one, possibly even two international visitors. So the maximum cost there is about four grand. 
how much does it cost to hire a wedding venue for an hour? And how much does it cost to hire a limo for an hour and the formal wear for an hour? So he said, worst case scenario, you might be up for five or $6,000. Now, bearing in mind that he was charging a premium, so he was charging in the range of two to three times what his competitor was charging, which means even if he had to pay out on the guarantee, which I don't think he ever has to date, uh, it would cost him a maximum of five to six thousand dollars out of his fee, which is around seven or eight thousand. Now that's better than disappointing the bride, her not being happy in the photos, and just not paying. Because we've got to think about what happens as a result of this guarantee as well. If he ever did have to pay out on this guarantee, the word of mouth that he would get from that would be viral. But even if he doesn't, just the fact that he put such a strong guarantee in place massively improves his conversion rate and also the word of mouth marketing that occurs. Now, that's an extreme example. What I would suggest that you need to think about is, are you offering a written guarantee in your business? Because if you're not, you're missing out on a point of difference, which would actually differentiate the price that you charge, because it actually backs you. Now, let's think about the other side of the coin for the guarantee. This guy's got this guarantee, which is ludicrous, but do you, how cautious do you think he needs to be every time he goes out and does a wedding shoot? He takes five cameras with him every single time. He takes over a hundred photos every single time. Hundreds, actually, he takes a hundred. He used to take a hundred rolls of film. Now, what he does is he just makes sure that he's taking hundreds and hundreds of photos, because the last thing he wants is for anyone to have a claim on this guarantee. Now, charging a premium means that he was able to actually provide the service at that higher level. So, there's a lot in the guarantee. But let's talk about what happens. You know, commoditization is the thing that scares most people in business, because eventually. Someone else can do it better than you. Someone else can do it cheaper than you. It can be mass-produced mass overseas. And we start to see this problem. Like even butchers out there, you know, they're being confronted with supermarkets who are providing mass volumes of meat at much cheaper prices than they can provide. And this, this commodity issue is really what's killing a lot of businesses because they're not sure how to deal with this commoditization. See, one way to deal with it is to just reduce your price and be competitive on price. I don't think that's a good strategy. Because someone with deeper pockets or a bigger organization or greater leverage will beat you at that every single time. And as I mentioned before, you start working on price as your point of difference and you're making people loyal to price and not to product. So we need to think about what happens if we move from commodity upwards to be a little bit more valuable. We need to have unique products. Now, a product can be unique in some situations, but in a lot of cases, a product is just a product. I'll give you a simple example. If I buy a new phone today, you know, the phone that I buy, I can buy it from so many different stores and it'll be exactly the same model number of phone. So it's still potentially commoditized because it doesn't matter which store I buy it from, it's going to be the same phone. So it's still price sensitive. So if we combine the product with a service, then what we do is we end up with what's called an offering. Now, this is what's happened in the mobile phone space and this is why I use the example. If we go back to good old days, you used to buy your phone and then you would select a carrier and you would choose the service based on how many cents per minute they were charging. And the more minutes you bought, the less you paid for those minutes. Now, what you'll notice recently in, in the past five years is we don't buy phones anymore. What we do is we buy a deal. We buy an offering or a service that's combined with the phone, so it's a package. Now, when we buy this package, what happens is we get the phone on a plan, we stick with the plan for two years, and the phone is technically free. Now, I want you to think about what that is. It's not a free phone. We're paying for it in the package, but they're being bundled deliberately. And by bundling them, it actually makes it harder to differentiate which is the better product. So in the mobile phone space, people are starting to buy these bundled plans. And the product itself, the phone, is commoditized. So the only way to get it into the mix and people still need the product is to combine it as an offering. Now, I want you to think about your business. Because what we need to do is we need to start thinking about what is commoditized within the business. Is it a product or is it a service? How do we combine things together to create a package? Because as soon as I put a bundle together and I provide it as an offering, all of a sudden it's something that could be quite distinctive in the marketplace. So if we offer a service pack or if we offer a combination of maybe a product and a service together, now we can tailor it so that people can't compare things on price anymore. So this offering is really where we start to see some profit come back into the business. Now, it does take some creative thinking because the average person in business is really just sitting there saying, well, I'm not worried about all this. I'm just worried about paying my bills. And so it takes time out for you to think about how can you package things up. 
because the way that we can start differentiating is to actually create our own packages. Now I'll draw this line here and I talk about the difference between offerings because they can still be seen as competitive because they're still coming down product to product or service. We want to start thinking in terms of experience. Now the story I'll use here is um, for some of you out there you might have recognized a few years back when um, you know home cinemas became the big thing. And everyone wanted to get a home cinema and you get this big TV and they're not that expensive and you get this nice couch with the holes cut out so you could put your drinks in the armrests so you could replicate a cinema in your home. And how awesome would this be is that you don't even have to leave the house to watch a cinematic movie. You can sit in your own lounge room, have your own popcorn and not be surrounded by all of these other people that you don't know. So people went down this track of buying these home cinemas thinking it was the best thing ever and it was the death of the cinema. Now let's think about what actually happened here. People started building these home cinemas, and I know a lot of people that have them. Some people use them often. Most people realize that it actually wasn't the home cinema that they wanted. What they were missing was the whole experience of going out to the movies. So the movies have resurged themselves now, and people are paying premiums again. You know, we're up to $18 to $20 for a ticket to go to the cinemas. The cinemas are packed. And the reason they're packed is people get dressed, they go out, they meet their friends, they have a coffee, they go out for dinner, they enjoy a movie. So it's the whole experience that people are paying for. Now, I would suggest the same is happening in retail. Uh, retail spaces where it used to be all about just having a product that people could buy. That section's been commoditized by the internet and people are now looking for a bit more from their retailer. And I'm not saying more as in cheaper prices. What they're saying is if I'm going to bother coming to your store, you better make the experience pretty good. And so we really need to start thinking in terms of how do we provide a customer experience so that people can start coming in or buying from us more regularly, not because of just the service or product, but because it actually makes them feel better. Now, if we can think about this, this actually takes us way out in front of the field because too many business owners out there are just thinking survival. They're just thinking about how do I compete? And they're thinking in terms of price. They're not thinking in terms of customer experience. And people go, oh, you know, this experiencing, it's just way beyond what I'm thinking about. Well, not true, right? People are experiencing your business as it stands, as either somewhere they enjoy going or somewhere they need to go or somewhere they hate going, but they have to go there anyway because there's no alternatives. But watch out if you're in that category. Because if you can get people to actually get excited about coming to your store or attending your business or interacting with your business, then what you're going to do is you're going to start to build a cult following. And people who come to you because of the experience will stay with you regardless of price. They might be sensitive to price. They might ask you about price. But you know what? They're coming to you because they love interacting. Now, let's think about that experience as being unique. And it's easier to make an experience unique than it is to make a product unique. And we go one step further. What we talk about is we talk about the whole idea of doing this as a minimum. Now, this is where you'll become a winner. All right? And I'll go back to the Apple example because if anyone's been into an Apple store, you'll understand what experience is all about. You walk into an Apple store and it's a totally different retail experience to any other store that you've ever been into. Now, that's not by accident and that's not just because they've got young kids working there. That is a highly architected, specifically designed environment to encourage people to come in. Their product placement, the color of the t-shirts, the way people greet you, the whole layout of the store is all based on giving customers an experience. They want people to hang around. Now, you've got to remember, Apple products, they've only got about a half a dozen to a dozen different products in their whole range. And what that means is it's a pretty easy business to run. So they're not out, they're not out there trying to maximize the number of products. And they're definitely not price competitive in what they sell because they sell at quite high margins. And people still love them. And the reason they love them is because the experience is there. Now, we can use a different example. Let's talk about, you know, in the motorcycle world, you know, the Harley Davidson motorcycle. You know, there's a brand. Now, anyone who knows anything about technology knows that the, the Harley Davidson is not a technology leader as far as building motorcycles, but people will still pay a premium. They're still seen as one of the most expensive motorcycles you can buy, and they're buying brand. You know, they're buying brand because they're buying the experience of being a Harley owner. So what can we do to make sure that our experience is unique? Let's keep going with this as we climb up this ladder. Um, the next thing that we start looking at is um, transformation. Now, this is a big term, it's a big word, but when people fall in love with your product, your service, or your experience in your business, what happens is if you change their lives, if you change the way they operate on a daily basis, you've got them for life. And more importantly than that, they're gonna be telling the world about you and you're gonna get into word of mouth marketing. 
Now, it's a bit ideal, but I want you to think about how can I now create such an experience that people just go out and tell all their friends about it because this is really how we can start building a difference in our business. And even one step beyond this is going into risk reversal. Now, going back to the example of the guy with the uh, wedding photography business, um, risk reversal for him was pretty simple. It was how do I take all the pain out of making a decision? Now, what looks like high risk from someone from the outside in his head is actually low risk because he never wants a client to be out there saying, yeah, I got my photos done by that guy and they were okay. He wants people to actually be in love with his photos, show them to everyone and say, these are fantastic. So he's put himself to the test here by putting a risk reversal strategy in place. So the question I have for you is, what can you do to reverse the risk that your potential customers have when they come to see you? Let's keep going. Let's talk about the key to business success because I can already sort of sense a lot of people are thinking, yeah, well, this is all great, but here's my problem. How much time have I got to actually do this? How do I learn how to do this stuff? You've given me some theory. You've given me some stories, but in the practicality of things, I just don't have the time or the wherewithal to, I couldn't be bothered. Here's one of the keys to business success. It's the term leverage. Now, if you think about what leverage is, it's pretty simple. It's about how can I do more with less? And the trick of doing more with less has been around for many, many years. And if you look at the picture that I've got on the screen, we talk about, you know, how do you lift a really heavy rock? Well, you get a really long stick and you get a small rock or a fulcrum. And you can use that mechanism to actually lift pretty heavy weights. So if we talk about it in, this, in the context of business and we talk about leverage within business, this is my terminology. It's always going to be a question of how do I do more with less? How can I get more done with less effort? How can I get more customers to be contacted without having to ring every single one? How can I get more people in my store with less uh, stock in my store? So if you keep thinking in terms of how can I do more with less, it doesn't make any sense when you first look at this and go, the only way to do more to get more is to do more. Well, it's not true. See, there is leverage points within a business, and I'm going to go through those leverage points with you right now so that we can talk about how to do this. Now, the way we're going to do it is we're going to use this terminology, divide to multiply. And what I mean by that is to get leverage within my business, to get more with less, I need to actually look at each of the components, so break my business down into its components, and then focus on every single one of those components and work out how to improve it. And then when I add it all back together, I get the multiplication effect. So how does that look? Well, let's talk about marketing, okay? Because ultimately marketing is a big expense for a company. And you know, if you talk to your accountant, they'll teach you that sales and marketing is an expense. And here's the problem with calling it that. Because we know, you know, a lot of you guys are using the lo loyalty group for your marketing efforts. Now, if marketing is done well, it shouldn't be seen as an expense. But the reason it is, is because in accounting categorization, it's actually put into the expense column. Now, the problem with calling an expense is when things get tough and when business gets a bit tight and I go to my accountant and say, look, business is a bit tight, what should I do? His natural response to that is, David, cut your expenses. And I think, okay, so I've got to cut my expenses. I look on my expense list. I say, what's costing me a lot of money? It's typically wages. It's typically advertising. It's typically marketing. And so I cut my marketing, I cut my wages, I reduce my sales staff and I do the work myself. And guess what happens over the next few months? All of a sudden, my business goes down. And I think to myself, geez, that economy is killing me or that competitor next door is killing me. I'm running out of money. I go back to the account and he says, cut your expenses even more and I'm on a downward spiral. So what we need to do is we need to change our view and we need to move from the accounting view of marketing and sales to the entrepreneur's view of marketing and sales. And what is that? Well, simply it is that we don't look at marketing and sales as an expense. We look at it as an investment. Now, what's the difference? Now, really, expense, investment, it's still money going out. There's only one subtle difference, and this is really key. An investment is something that gives me a return. And what I mean by that is for every dollar that I put out, I need to make sure I'm getting more dollars coming back. And if I know that's happening, all of a sudden, it's not an expense. Because if I knew for every dollar that I spent on marketing, I was getting a dollar fifty back in profit, I'd be pretty excited. And you know what? When things were going tough, I'd say, well, let's throw some more money at my marketing. Because for every dollar I put in, I get a dollar fifty back. I wouldn't be cutting my marketing expenses. I'd be lifting my marketing investment. So how do we do this? Well, the very first thing we need to do is we need to start testing our marketing. And testing marketing is pretty simple. It's just really about putting marketing out there and seeing whether it works or not. 
Now, I'm not talking about subjectively looking at it going, yeah, I think that's a good ad. What I'm talking about is numbers, right? Because the second part of testing is that we need to measure. And we need to measure the return on our investment of marketing. We need to measure the number of leads that we're getting from every lead source. We need to measure our conversion rate. There's so many things that we need to measure, but I'm going to break it down into some simple terms for you so that you can understand this. A bit like an unlimited marketing budget. Oh, I'll tell you what, I'd love one. Here's how we do it. If we start testing and measuring, we're going to be looking for two numbers. Now, the first number I want to be looking for is a thing called acquisition cost. So what's acquisition cost? Pretty simply, it's how much does it cost me to buy a new client? Now, think about what that means. How much does it cost me to buy a new client? That is cost per client or CPC, depending on how you want to talk about it. How do I work this out? Well, it's pretty simple. I look at how many new clients I get for a period, say for the past month. And I look at how much I invested in marketing, sales, salespeople, and I divide one by the other, and I'll work out how much each one of those clients cost me. Now, the reason I need to know that number is because once I measure something, then I can adjust it or I can work on it and I can reduce it. So once I know how much it costs me to buy a new client, I work on reducing this. The second really important number we need to know is a thing called lifetime value. What's lifetime value about? Well, it's really simple. Lifetime value is how much, does a, how much will a customer spend with me in their lifetime? Now, how do I know this number? Well, think about this. However long you've been in business, you can start telling me how long your clients have been with you. If you're new, you might only have a client for a year or two. But you need to start taking notice of how long a client stays with you. Because one of the keys to marketing is not just getting new clients. The other one is to actually keep the clients that you currently have. Now, the way we keep clients that we currently have is to make sure that they're happy, to make sure that we're addressing their needs, to make sure that we adapt to what's changing within the marketplace so that they can, we can keep that relationship. Because once we know this number called lifetime value, our job is to increase it. So two things we need to do with our marketing. We need to reduce our cost of acquiring new customers. We need to increase the value that they spend with us in their lifetime. So let's sort of get down to the tax of how to do this. This is a little bit technical, but if you can track with me on this, I think you'll find this is probably one of the most valuable marketing lessons that you'll ever get. Um, and we, I call it the five proven ways to increase business profits because I think one of the key things here is that, and I'll just put this up on the screen and I'll go through it. Um, if we think about why we're in business, ultimately the reason we're in business is to make a profit. And you'll notice this formula that I put up on the screen. The last thing at the bottom of this formula is profit. Now, if you think about where profit comes from, it generally comes from our revenue or our turnover, and it's the bit we get to keep. So the, if we multiply that by our profit margin, which is a percentage, that gives us our profit. Now, let's work backwards up this formula and say, okay, so turnover is revenue. It's how much money comes into the business. Where does it come from? Well, if you think about it, it comes from customers. And not only does it come from customers, they actually need to spend money with us. So if we look at customers and we multiply it by the number of transactions, that's how often they spend with us and how much they spend on average, then those three numbers should equal turnover. Now, average dollar sale is really how much someone spends on average. Now, to work that number out, it's pretty simple. All I need to do is look at how much money comes into my business over a period of time. It might be a day or a week. And I divide it by the number of invoices or the number of receipts that I've issued in that time. And that'll give me the average. Now, I want you to start thinking in terms of measuring these things exactly, not just guessing them. Because when we measure them exactly, then we can change something and see what that has, what impact that has on a number rather than just saying, oh, I think you know our average dollar sale went up. Well, let's go into some of the detail around this. Customers, where do they come from? We don't just get customers. We actually either get leads or we convert leads. So we have to get inquiry, and then we need to convert that inquiry into a paying customer. So you'll notice that the five areas that are in green on the screen are things that we can change, where the three areas that are in purple on the screen, they're actually after the equal sign, so they're a result of the other numbers. So I just wanted to show you this formula, but we're going to put some actual figures in so you can understand how this works, because this is key. So on the left-hand side, you'll notice we've got this formula, and we're going to just use a typical example. Now, what I need you to start thinking in terms of is how this would look within your business. So let's assume we measure over a year. 
And in this particular business that we're using as an example here, we count the number of inquiries that come in, whether it's email, walk-in or telephone, and we count that there's 4,000 people that knock on our door and ask us how much, or they ask us, can you help me? And we just count them so that we know how many inquiries we're getting. Now we also know how many people buy from us. So we know what our conversion rate is. Now in this particular example, I'm going to use 25%, which is a fairly reasonable, I don't know if it's good or bad for you, but it's just a conversion rate, which means one in four people will buy. What that means is we've acquired a thousand new customers in this model. Okay, so let's imagine we've got these thousand customers and we also know that by their very nature, they actually transact with us twice a year. So they come in, you know, twice a year to spend money with us. And on average, they spend $100. So we're going to keep it fairly simple. So if we look at this, 1,000 times 2 is 2,000. 2,000 times 100 is 200,000. So our turnover or revenue for this business is 200,000. And we know that our profit margin is around 25%. So we get to take out of this business 50 grand. Not a bad business, not a great business, just a set of numbers. Now, what I need you to start converting is how can I measure these things or what can I measure within my business right now? And I'll explain to you why it's so important. If we went to work on this business, in general, people say I'd love to make more profit. And what they don't realize is if we divide things down into these five areas, it's actually a lot easier to focus on. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions as we go through this. Um, let's imagine that we worked on your business for 12 months and we, we wanted to increase leads because most people do want to increase the number of inquiry they're getting, number of inquiries they're getting or increase the number of leads. And I'm going to go for a fairly conservative number. Okay, so in this example, this is a dog kennel. Just so you can visualize, there's the dog kennel. People are spending $100 to send their dog there. They're sending them there twice a year. Um, we've got 1,000 customers coming through and that's the sort of numbers that we would get. So, so let's go for a 10% increase with this business. So the first thing I want to do is I want to work on leads. Now, if I focused in on leads only within a business, I said, you know, I just want to get 10% more inquiry into my business over a 12-month period. I'm not going to go for doubling my leads. I'm not going to go for 30% chunk, just 10% more. So instead of 4,000, I'm going to get 4,400. Now, how would I do that? There's multiple ways. But the most common ones these days is going to be some sort of advertising online. So it might be Google AdWords. It might be search engine optimization. It might even be the local paper putting an ad in there. It might be flyers. It might be letters. There's so many different ways that we can generate leads. But I'm only going to go for a 10% increase because I don't want to get too hung up on just inquiry at the moment. Then the second thing I'm going to start focusing in on is my conversion rate. Now, how do we improve conversion rate? Well. Some simple ways, the very first thing that we can do is we can start looking at our sales process. What do we do to engage a client? What questions are we asking them when they make their first inquiry? What information or what sort of materials are we using to help with the sales process? Do we have a brochure? Do we have a presentation? Do we have some samples? Is there a way that we can actually help people make this decision? Now, going back to a few examples back, we talked about the um, wedding photographer. Their guarantee absolutely blitz their conversion rate because all of a sudden it took away the fear of making a decision. So I want you to think about what can you do to improve your conversion rate. If you haven't had sales training and you're in business, that's the one I'd go for. If you haven't got a sales process or you don't have sales materials, that's the one I'd go for. If you don't have a written guarantee, you can put that on the list as well. There's probably about 70 to 80 different ways that we can improve conversion rate. I just want you to think about a 10% increase so instead of 25, we're going to go for a 27.5% conversion rate. So not 10% up, not 35%, but 27.5%. Now, this is key. Let's see what happens when we put two 10% increases in place. What would you expect the number of customers to go to? See, a lot of people would assume it should go up by 20%. because that make sense? Two 10% increases are 20%. But what actually occurs is that because of the multiplication effect, of the two numbers, the leads and conversion, we get a compounding effect. What I mean by that is instead of a 20% increase in customers, we now have a 21% increase in customers. So we don't get 1,200, we get 1,210. Now, 10 extra customers doesn't sound like much, but let's think about what actually happened. We could have just increased leads by 20% by just putting more money into advertising, which is what most people would do. But what we just started to recognize is if we work on two different areas and split our risk into two different areas, so instead of 20% in leads, we put 10% in leads and 10% into conversion, we now get 10 extra clients for nothing. 
And this is the magic of compound interest. Now, often it's taught to us as this is how you can do your uh, investment. This is how you do your wealth creation. Not many people put it down to how I can do my marketing as well. So let's keep going with this. It's a bit interesting, but it gets more interesting. Um, so number of transactions, how do we get people to come back and spend more money with us? Well, the simplest way is to ask them. <laughs> and it sounds obvious, but so many people are so busy just trying to find new customers and just you know spending too much time with time wasters and just running around like crazy, they don't actually have a recontact system. They don't have a database. They're not sending out any email newsletters, any special offers. They're not doing anything like that. All they're really doing is just looking for new customers all the time. Now, here's the fact. It costs six times more to get a new customer than it does to get an existing customer to come back. But so many of us are just have this underlying assumption, that, you know, if they want to come back, they'll just come back. But the truth of the matter is we need to have a systematic approach in place so that we can get people to spend with us again. Now, if we just go for a 10% increase in number of transactions once again, just from 2 to 2.2, it's not that hard to do. Over a 12-month period, we could probably do that. And we could do it through either newsletter or through, you know, maybe having closed-door sales, special client events, um, uh, offer on next purchase, a loyalty card. There's so many different ways that we can get people to come back. But if we don't capitalize on this, we're letting money leak out of our sieve. So we're going to just go for a 10% increase here. And now we're going to talk about the next one, which is average dollar sale. Now, what's this one about? Average dollar sale is really simple. It's how do I get someone to spend more in the transaction? So they're already spending with me, and I just want them to spend a few dollars more. Not a lot more, just a few dollars more. We're going to go for 10%. So from $100 on average, we want people to start spending 110 How do we do this? Well, this one's pretty tricky because it's actually asking people if they would like to get something else while they're there. Now, if I'm a butcher shop, it's really just making sure that we've got some sort of special on the go that we mention to every single customer. If I'm a car salesperson, what I'm going to make sure is I have an aftermarket sales process. You know, so really every business can do this, but so few people systemize their upsell. And I'll tell you why upsells are so important, because the person is already purchasing from you. They've already decided they like you and they want to do business with you. Their wallet's already open. And for them to spend an extra $10 when they're spending 100 is simple. It's just a matter of asking. So we're going to focus in on each of these areas. Now we've done four 10% increases in four different areas within the business. Let's have a look at what's happened now to the actual turnover of this business. Some people would be naive and say, you know, that's a 40% improvement, four times 10%, but we know better. And what we know, it's a 46% increase. We've gone from a $200,000 turnover to 292820 Now think about what that means in terms of business growth. This business has grown nearly 50%. And we've done it over a 12-month period. And we've done it by doing four simple 10% increases in four distinctly different areas. Simple but powerful. Let's keep going with this one. So we'll go for profit margin. Now people say, well, how do you improve profit margin? There's only two ways. You can either increase your price or you can decrease your costs. My preference is increase prices. Oh, got a bit of a typo there. That should be 27.5. Um, I want to go for a 10% increase. Now let's just do it. You'll have to use your imagination here and think that that 25 is a 27.5. Um, and the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to usually push for a price increase. Now, most people are fearful of price increase. They go, hang on, David, you said uh, this whole wor workshop was about how to eliminate price competition. Well, what I'll suggest to you is that when we start focusing on the other areas, price is not the primary reason people make a decision anymore. Now, you can increase prices, but you don't use your price-sensitive items to increase. You can sometimes go for the secondary item. So supermarkets call it a loss leader. What they'll do is they'll put either Coke or meat or something that people see as a commodity on the front page of their flyer and they'll put it out at a special price and they know people are going to walk in the door and they're not just going to buy that product, they're going to buy other things. So if you're strategic about how you increase your prices, you can actually generate quite a bit of profit out the back end. And this price increase thing is critical. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Let's just go through the final number and I'll go through these full figures with you. So if we did increase that to a 27.5%, all of a sudden our profit margin has gone from $50,000 to $80,000. Now, think about what that means. $50,000 to $80,000 means an extra thirty grand. Now, ironically, 
We don't own a dog kennel anymore, right? Because we're now doing upsells, we're doing cross sells, we're getting people to come more often. We now have a spa. <laughs> I know it's a funny picture and it looks a bit odd, but I'll tell you now that this guy running the dog kennel that also does a dog spa is going to be making a lot more profit than the person who's trying to compete on how much you pay to put your dog in the kennel twice a year. So I'm just trying to open your eyes to what's possible because this compounding effect can be quite tremendous and it can be quite profound. It can be quite profound in how our business grows. It can be quite profound in how it affects our profitability. 46% increase in turnover, 61% increase in profit. So my question, you know, what would you do next year with an extra 61% or $30,000? Because sometimes we forget that business is not just about making money. Because money is just a means to an end. The question is, what would you do with the extra 30? You know, some people say I'd take a holiday. Some people say I'd be able to pay for someone to come and help me so I don't have to work so hard. Other people say, well, David, I'd give you the money so you can help me do this thing. Now, it's totally up to you. Um, but I want you to think in terms of what that money would mean to you. And here's just an interesting activity. So let's do this. Let's assume just for fun we can increase that number by 100%. Now, not in one year, but maybe over the next five to 10 years. And I just want you to think about this as a possibility. Is it possible to increase the number of leads in your business from 4,000 to 8,000 over the next five to 10 years? Just is it possible? And I want you to think about the same with conversion. Now, if we spent money on advertising, we could go to 8,000, no problem. It's just a matter of how much you're willing to spend. Conversion's a little bit different, but what I'd suggest is if you haven't had in-depth sales training, if you don't have a documented sales process, if you don't have a written guarantee, Doubling your conversion rate is not that difficult. It's really a matter of focusing in on it, having a system, having someone look at it and help you double that conversion rate by offering some better services. I'll give you a great story on this one too. We were doing some work with a retail store and the first thing we do to improve conversion rate is measure it. So what we did in this store is we just started counting how many people walked in the store versus how many people bought. And I think the number was around 16 or 17% which is neither good nor bad, it's just a number. Um, but we kept measuring things and we kept trying different, different sort of strategies, different scripts and so forth. And one day we noticed a funny thing. What we noticed is that every time that a lady would take some clothes into the changing room, the conversion rate from a person in the changing room to a purchase was 80%. So we moved from this 16% conversion from people walking in to 80% for people moving into the change room. What we quickly realized is that the salesperson on the floor did not have to sell clothes. That was the wrong thing. All they needed to do was make sure that if someone was interested in some sort of piece of clothing, they just got them into the change room. We actually had to make sure they added a couple of extra change rooms in the store because there was that many people trying clothes on. But what it did is it had quite a profound effect on their conversion rate. So sometimes it's just about looking at what you're currently doing and having a look at it slightly differently. So. If we think about it, is it possible to double conversion rate over a five to 10 year period? It's possible. So now what happens is we've got now 50% of 8,000 leads. We've got a pretty big business. We've got 4,000 clients instead of 1,000 clients. But just keep going with me on this. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to say, how can we double the number of transactions? Well, it's a bit trickier, right? How do we get people to come in twice as often? Well, we'd probably have to provide a lot of other products. We'd probably have to make sure that we have our arms wrapped around the client so they're coming to us all the time and they're totally loyal. We might even have to create some new products that don't exist. So let's think about this over the next five to 10 years. Is it possible? Well, could be, right? So doubling from two takes us to four. Is it possible to double the average dollar sale? Well, you know, getting someone to spend 200 instead of 100 is not impossible. Yes, we'd probably have to have some pretty good strategies in place. But remember, this is a five to 10 year project. Now think about that in terms of business years because most people I meet in business, they might have been in business for 5, 10 or 15 years, but the, 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 the level of experience they have isn't 15 years, it's one year photocopied 5, 10 or 15 times because they just do the same thing every year. If you start changing the way you operate, if you start thinking differently, if you start thinking doggy day spa as opposed to dog kennel, you can actually radically change what happens in the business. Let's look at this number. So 4,000 times 4 times 200. I won't keep you in suspense. What I will tell you is that it's a big number. We're talking about growing this business from a $200,000 business to a $3.2 million business over the next 5 to 10 years by doubling four numbers. Now, this is a model and it is for fun. Some people say, I can't do that in my business. Well, 
okay, maybe we can't double four numbers, but do you think we can double two or three of them? And let's imagine we doubled the profit, went to 50%, we'd have something like a $1.6 million profit. Now, I'm not saying this is easy. What I'm suggesting is it's possible. And I'm not saying you should go for a $1.6 million profit. What I'm saying is the minimum, the current status of this business was 50000 And what we said is somewhere between a 10% growth to 100% growth will get us up to 80000 to $1.6 million in profit. What's stopping you from doing this is that you're too busy, you're playing below the line, it's the economy, it's the competitor, it's all these different things that make life too hard. My suggestion is that if you're in business and you've got this opportunity to get smarter about how you grow it, you need to start thinking in terms of what I need to do. So just a quick sort of uh, flip chart here. Sometimes we talk about, you know, it's a great idea, David, what, what, what you've shown me is great. I really need to go away and do it. Now, if you've got a good idea out of today's webinar, then I'd suggest that your likelihood of doing something with that is around 10%. The reality is if you want this to be more likely to change the way you do things, you need to actually commit to doing something different because learning to do something and doing something are two different things. If you want a 40% likelihood of success, then you need to start putting a plan in place. You need to state when you want to do things by. This comes down to business planning because one, one of the, this, this is another area that's really key is it's great to show you how to do these things, but what I've found is if you don't know, have a specific plan that tells you you need to do things, then it just becomes another idea on a piece of paper. If you want to go to 50% likelihood of being, being successful, you need a specific plan. If you want 60%, you need to commit to someone else. Now, why do you need to commit to someone else? Well, you know, it's pretty simple. What happens is when you have someone outside holding you to account, you've got nowhere to go. Because one of the dangers of being a business owner is that you're sitting there in your own business and ultimately no one cares whether you're successful or not. And you can tell stories all day long about how tough it is out there and people aren't going to argue with you. They're just going to believe you. This is what they do. So if you start thinking in terms of who can I share this plan or who can I commit to these goals with, your likelihood of being successful go from 50 to 60%. 95% if you actually have someone who's tracking with you. This is one of the reasons I do what I do because as a business coach, what I've learned is if I can track with someone's performance on their plan, the likelihood of them being successful goes from being 10%, which is I've seen this sort of stuff, it looks really cool, to 95% because we're now tracking with a plan and making sure they execute on what they need to. So really this is just about you doing something with what you've learned today. You know, one of the things, and I've often talked to Chris about this, is, uh, you know, people are really good at what they do in their business. That's the reason they're in it. The reason people become butchers is because they actually are good at, they're good at slicing meat up. They're good at speaking with customers. They're actually good at helping. They're good at serving people. But one thing they're usually lacking is this ability to uh, run a business because we go into the business because of the trade that we're in, not because of our business skills. You know, this is one of my favorite books, Richard Branson. He, he wrote in this book, he said, if you can learn to run one business successfully, there's no reason you can't run a number of businesses at the same time, because the principles are the same. What I'm teaching you today, what I've showed you about price competition applies to every business. There's no business that's different. They're all the same. And what you need to start considering is, how do I get these things applied to my business model so that I can grow? Because if you can do that, then what starts to happen is you get this ability to leverage yourself, to start building your profitability and start getting some of your life back. James Rohn said it well too. Um, he was a famous business philosopher. And uh, I read his book when I was about 21 years old. And the first thing he said was, never wish life were easier. Wish that you were better. Because the truth is, we can't control what goes on outside. We can't control the economy. We can't control the weather. We can't control the competitors. The only thing we really can control is how we think and how we operate and what we do. The second thing that he said that was interesting was working harder on yourself than you do on your job. It took me a while to get this, but what he said is, uh, really, you, your career might change, your business might change, but the truth of the matter is there's one person that's going to stay with you to the day you die, and that's you. So what you do to build your knowledge, to build your abilities and to build your skills is something that's going to give you infinite returns because it's going to be with you forever. So you can sort of see the thread of the message here is I can teach you the fundamentals of how to build a business and how to get out of price competition, but in the end, it's going to come back to you. It's going to come back to your decision to actually do something with the things that I've taught you. 
Now, if you're interested in doing something with the things that I've taught you, I would encourage you to jump online, get onto my website. There's a lot of resources there. It's davidguest.com.au. And uh, what I'd suggest you do is you, you, you sort of jump on there and there are some fantastic videos on there, some fantastic audios on there. And for those who are on the call today, I'll also send out an email with a link. And I'm happy to have a chat with anybody uh, just to really get the specifics of their business and just really teach them how they can apply the principles we've talked about today. Because sometimes all it takes is for someone to get you off your butt to do something. And if that's all we get out of today's session, then I've been successful. Whether it's talking to me, whether it's buying a book, whether it's waking up tomorrow morning and doing one thing different in your business, if you don't take action with what you learn, there's no traction. So I hope today's been pretty valuable. Um, if there is any questions, and we look, we are running out of time, so I probably won't be able to answer them, but if you put them through the question box, um, I'll try and endeavor to answer those in the thank you email that goes out. Look, I'd like to thank you guys for your attention and for your time today. Um, I hope you've got some value out of today. Um, I am willing to take those questions offline, so send them through in the email. Um, other than that, look, good luck with the business. Remember, there is no price competition out there. It's really just a mindset. And start thinking in terms of how can I add value to my client base? How can I add value to the people that I'm working with? And you'll come out streets ahead. Thanks very much for your time, guys. Good luck with everything, and hopefully we'll catch up in the future. Cheers.